This is uh, the first of three short talks on the topic of foreclosure. We're going to be slowly but surely making our way into a domain of Lacanian psychoanalysis, which will help us explain, I think, fairly definitively, um, one crucial distinction. That between the domain of neurosis, which is a certain order, you could say, of psychotic suffering, and the domain of psychosis. So, as is my habit, I'll give you two uh, free association examples, uh, ideas, just to get things going. The first, this is an anecdote that comes to mind. Many years ago, uh, John Lennon was asked, what was it about your first meeting with Yoko Ono that so impressed you? And he recalled going to an exhibition and I think he had to climb up some ladder at an installation, look through some device, and in there he saw a word. The word was yes. And he said to the interviewer, there was something about that quality of affirmation that was important to me. If it had said no, I don't think I would have hung around. It said yes. Okay, first anecdote. Second anecdote, it's not so much an anecdote, but a question. And it's probably going to involve me butchering a piece of Hegelian philosophy. But my guess is, my distant memory, is that somewhere within Hegel, there's a, a, a question of sorts or a suggestion of sorts. And I've chosen to remember it, however rightly or wrongly, in this form. What is the human equivalent or the equivalent within human social subjectivity of tree roots? What's the human equivalent of tree roots? We'll come back to both of those examples as we move on. What I'm going to do immediately then is make a couple of references to Freud. And the reason I'm doing this is so that we can start to get a sense of an area where Freud is struggling in the early days of psychoanalysis. He, he thinks repression is a key defense mechanism, you could say, a key means of dealing with traumatic, disturbing experiences. Now, if you've already spent some time with me or looked at dream theory, we'll see that we have a whole series of concepts that may help us think about repression. We've got the notion of displacement, displacement whereby um, there's a kind of substitution, uh, a substitution for one thing, uh, something is substituted for one thing by something that's close to it. Or we also have displacement understood in terms of the severing of affects from ideas. All of this material that he analyzes and describes is a way that dreams do their disguising, that, that uh, unconscious latent ideas start to be transformed into the, the manifest content of the dream. All of those mechanisms can be applied to an understanding of repression. And for much of Freud's work, repression is the big mechanism. But there are a couple of moments when he, he butts up against something that doesn't seem properly explainable in terms of repression. And of course, this is the important preamble to how we're going to start thinking about foreclosure. So here's an example. Um, we'll be using a series of uh, examples from Freud's famous case histories. This is just a, a, a pelican collection of some of those. We'll make reference to the Wolfman and we'll also make reference to the Judge Schreiber case. So here's a, a, an incident reported in the Wolfman case. I'm just going to cite it directly. Um, Freud is, as it were, citing the words of, of, of the wolfman. I was playing in the garden near my nurse. I was carving with my pocket knife in the bark of one of the walnut trees that came into my dream as well. Suddenly, to my unspeakable terror, I had noticed that I'd cut through the little finger of my hand so that it was only hanging by its skin. I felt no pain but great fear. I did not venture to say anything to my nurse, who was only a few paces distant, but I sank down on the nearest seat and sat there, incapable of casting another glance at my finger. At last I calmed down, took a look at my finger, and saw that it was entirely uninjured. What is Freud going to make of this? Well, one observation is that it seems that there was a hallucination of sorts. Now, the phenomena that has just been described, where one is seeing something, one has terrible, uh, horrific experience of something that appeared not to in fact have happened, Indeed, it sounds like a hallucination. Is that something we can explain through the dynamics of repression? Well, apparently not. So here's our first quote then. In the Wolfman case, Freud makes this note. Repression seems very different from a type of condemning judgment. 
And we will start to, of course, Lacan helps us do this, we'll start to make this differentiation between repression on the one hand, which pushes material into the unconscious, which represses material, and to repress something implies that to repress something, there is something there that's initially recognized, initially acknowledged, that then is repressed. There's a difference between that and something that seems to be a more radical externalization or a more radical exclusion. So that's our first moment in, in the Wolfman case. Then we can move on to the Schreber case. So the Schreber case, Freud takes the memoirs of Judge Daniel Schreber, uh, a famous case uh, in the history of psychiatry, uh, a man who in very lucid and articulate terms describes his psychotic breakdown and his ensuing schizophrenia in an awful lot of detail. And, uh, and Freud has something to say about this case. In speaking of the paranoid delusions and hallucinations and the uh, persecutory delusions of Judge Schreber, as described in Judge Schreber's memoirs, he says, what is being described is an internal perception that is suppressed. Its contents enter consciousness in the form of an external perception. Its contents enter consciousness in the form of an external perception. And what we are dealing with is some kind of suppression. So he has this account of trying to figure out how do we theorize, how do we understand these persecutory delusions? But the more he thinks about it, he thinks that this idea that there is something, an internal perception that is suppressed, he thinks this is not quite right. Initially, he thinks that this internal perception that is suppressed, this idea that some contents are entering consciousness in the form of an external perception, needs to be changed. Initially, he thinks he can describe that through the notion of projection. Of course, you could say, especially today, where that notion is so omnipresent, part of everyday psychological language, that projection is probably not the most accurate term to use here. One of the reasons it seems a not particularly accurate uh, concept to use is that normally when we're talking about projection, we're talking about taking, as it were, internal psychological contents and projecting them onto someone else or something else, an inside to outside. Whereas here, Freud seems also to be wary of how there's an outside to inside movement. So he himself is not happy with this notion of projection. And just to note the obvious, for future reference, Lacan doesn't like this idea of projection as a, as a psychical defense. It's, it's, it's too thin. It's, in some ways, you could say that it, that it presumes what it tries to explain, but it's not an accurate enough means of describing what's going on. So Freud then changes his mind and says, what was abolished internally returns from without. In fact, he even says it was incorrect to say that the perception which was suppressed internally is projected outwards. The truth is rather, as we now see, that what was abolished internally returns from without. What was abolished internally returns from without. Now that choice of words is interesting. When Lacan starts his seminar three, which is on the topic of psychosis, he wants to return to those words. What was abolished within returns from without. We will we'll make some comments on that. But what Freud is battling with here is, you could say, the notion of the therefore. This is a kind of radical ejection, a radical exclusion, which tries to describe some range of psychical phenomena, which is of a different parameter, a different, different paradigm to what's happening in repression. Now, you could argue that Freud never quite gets there to find the definitive articulation of this concept. And Lacanians, and Lacan himself, I suppose, will argue that they do get it, that they start to refine, uh, clarify what this notion of the vacuum might mean. And of course, it is exactly that term that Lacan wants to give the word foreclosure to. So he makes a distinction, drawing on these various elements within Freud, right at the beginning of his third seminar. And he says, he's talking about the repressed. Um, well, when we talk about re what is repressed, there must be a primal bejahum, okay, German term for a kind of acknowledgement and affirmation, an admission in the sense of the symbolic. In other words, 
Lacan's first step here is to say that when there's psychological material that's being repressed, there is necessarily, uh, as a first step, a kind of affirmation. There is some kind of recognition of something before it's repressed. And even if we don't want to put it in the, in the maybe challenging conceptual terms of beyond and negation and all of these concepts that will follow, let's just put it in these terms. If we are going to repress something, I've made the point already, there needs to be something to repress. You don't repress nothing. In other words, there is a kind of initial acknowledgement. Lacan then goes on to say, what, come the, what comes under the effect of repression returns? For repression and the return of the repressed are two sides of the same coin. Let's translate that. Whenever there is an unfortunate experience or something that I don't want to uh, have readmitted to consciousness, whenever there's repression, there's always a trace. There's always a little a clue that gets left behind. And we know that because you could say that there's Freudian slips, I make errors, I have bungled actions. All of these little clues are there, are left. Repression is never simply complete and absolutely successful. It always leaves a clue, a trace. And that's partly what is being said here when Lacan makes this affirmation that the repressed and the return of the repressed are one and the same. They're both there. This then suggests that what's happening with foreclosure is different. So, on the following page, building on his argument, Lacan says, whatever is refused in the symbolic order, in the sense of ver ver fum, reappears in the real. And he says it again further down that page. What is refused in the symbolic order reemerges in the real. And of course, what I'm trying to echo here is that he's using similar terms to what Freud was saying. What was abolished internally returns from without. He's echoing those same concepts but taking them one step further. Let's just think a little bit about how he's taking it one step further and then we'll wrap up on this first of our, our three mini lectures. One of the things that's crucial about how he reformulates what was abolished internally returns from without is he's doing it in terms of his three registers of symbolic, imaginary and real. Early Lacan wants to suggest that these are absolutely crucial innovations, crucial ways of being more accurate and more precise about how we think various psychoanalytic concepts. And in this situation, he seems to be correct. The case of what has happened to the young wolf man when he has this horrendous hallucinatory experience seems to suggest that there was something that was not properly acknowledged, recognized, not something that was properly marked, you could say, in the symbolic. What is not marked or acknowledged within the symbolic returns in the real, which is to say it returns in a kind of radically exterior form, in an intrusive phenomena, in something which comes from outside and which takes a different form. So behind repression, there is a kind of registration, symbolic registration. And it's important here, it's not just that something is, as it were, psychologically recognized. It's left a trace, it's left a mark, it has that symbolic impact. So what is, uh, in repression, there's a kind of symbolic registration. But what happens in a certain sphere of psychological phenomena, delusions, hallucinations, when it feels almost as if the unconscious is radically externalized and what the subject experiences comes dramatically from outside. This is, I think, what he's talking about when he says, whatever is refused in the symbolic via verbeful reappears in the real. I'm going to end up just with one question before we move on to our second lecture. And that is, what does Yoko Ono have to do with all of this? Where is her yes in this? What has this got to tell us? We could ask, what does Yoko Ono have to tell us about the Kenyan theory? And we can also add to that by stressing again the question of, what are the equivalent of roots? A tr what, are, what, what is the function that roots serve for a tree in the terms of human existence, human social existence?